Yes, well, we'll start with one that uh, is one that I've come up with myself rather than uh, any of our investors. And it is this. How should investors view developments in Ukraine? Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Uh, historically, I think, uh, is the way I would view it. Um, whereas I think quite a lot of people view it hysterically. Uh, you know, what, what, a difference, what a difference a single letter makes uh, on all these things. Um, uh, I've put some slides together for this because um, I think you know, we, we like to, when we're researching anything, try and start with a grasp of history and what's happened in the past, just as you know, give us some examples, and, and, uh, and with some facts. Um, and I think if you look back at how the market has reacted to uh, other uh, events uh, in, in sort of uh, outbreaks of fighting uh, or wars since World War II, we can get a few pictures. Mostly, um, I would say that they tend to um, support the, uh, the phrase that I think was, uh, is attributed to Nathaniel Rothschild, which is buy on the cannon. Uh, was uh, was uh, was his ma apparently his mantra in which the uh, the family fortune was founded. So we put together a few slides for you. You can see the first one is the Gulf War uh, of 1990 to 1991. Uh, the war kicked off on the 2nd of August 1990. I remember it well. I was in work that day, um, and you can see that was pretty close to the low for the market. If you have a look at uh, at that slide there, you'll see the uh, the 2nd of August is just a sort of a, a month and a bit below the low for the market. And uh, having attained that low, uh, the market was off to the races in terms of, uh, of return. Uh, obviously, we're looking at the S&P here as, uh, as an index uh, over the, uh, the next year or so, uh, basically. So uh, if, uh, I, think, I think if Nat Rothschild were looking at this, he would be pretty pleased with his, with his 1810 pronouncement or whatever it is that he came up with. Uh, the Six Day War of 1967. I was in school then, so I wasn't in work. Uh, <laughs> I remember that one well as well. I particularly remember General Moshe Dayan appearing on our television sets and telling us how things were going. Uh, 5th of June, 1967 to the 10th of June. Not, a, not very long, this. Um, you can see the 5th of June is very close to the low. Uh, in terms of the market there uh, and once again you know, obviously it's a bit of a roller coaster as markets can be uh, but once you've uh, survived that the market certainly uh, goes better it doesn't go off to the races but this is quite a short uh, war and quite a short period of time um, the Korean War uh, Korean War started 25th of June 1950 um, and lasted until 7th of July 1953 you can see here we've got a short slide here which is the 1951 you can see the start of the war again is very close to the low on, on the S&P um, and you can see that the market doesn't look back and climbs out of there and the next slide we've got for you is a longer one going out to the end of the war in 1953 buying on the cannon would certainly have been the right idea there um, so look I think the, the sweep of history suggests to us that probably buying on the cannon is the right thing. I've got one fear about uh, pursuing that. It's not quite fear, I would say. One concern about pursuing that. There's one other war to look at here, and it's the Yom Kippur War. And that's my final uh, war slide here. You can see the Yom Kippur War, uh, the market uh, basically went down, and it went down an awful lot more. And um, my concern, to be honest with you, and about that is that uh, we might be seeing some events which are a bit similar. What do I mean by that? Uh, the Yom Kippur War basically occurred during a period of inflation in the UK, the barber boom uh, and, uh, and the inflationary events of that, and of course was followed by the Arab oil boycott in which oil supplies were cut off to anyone who was seen as an uh, ally, friend or helper of the state of Israel, uh, and the oil price went up. Um, uh, good one for you is, uh, what did the oil price go from and to during this period? This is a good one for people to think about. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and the answer is a bit over $2 to a bit over $11. Here we are. Wow. <laughs> I suppose the percentage increase we should be looking at, isn't it? Um, but it's still, it's worrisome because clearly we've got the oil impact of, uh, of Russia, although its oil supply is not as big as the Arab oil supply. Right? So we're not looking at as big an effect in terms of uh, barrel, and we're not at least currently looking at as big a percentage in terms of uh, price increase. But I guess the other factor we should look at is the gas price. That is a bit more scary when you look at the gas price uh, out there. So, you know, I would say, uh, you know, in answer to your question that, um, that you're, uh, you've posed rather than the investors pose, I would say historically and, uh, and certainly with that one uh, example in mind uh, with quite a lot of concern. Julian, you got anything to add, subtract? Just in case people are interested in the, the just the plain numbers in terms of which of our companies are exposed to Russia and Ukraine, the only company which has really got significant exposure to Russia is Philip Morris International, 
um, and they have said it's about 6% of their revenues and about 10% of their volumes. And I think it would, it would be, from a commercial point uh, of view, a shame uh, if that market was closed off to them. Um, other than that, you may recall that Pepsi bought a business in Russia a while back uh, called uh, Wimbill Dan, um, and so they have about 4% of their revenues there. L'Oreal's got about 2%. Brown Foreman sells its Finlandia vodka there and has got about 1%. Um, but those are the only four companies that on statutory basis actually even report their exposure to Russia, and obviously the numbers for Ukraine are much smaller. Julian makes a good point. I mean, there's, there's, I, I've been talking about the indirect ex effects. The direct effects are not great. I mean, if you think of the Russian economy, uh, Russia is I don't know, about 3% of global GDP, I think. But if you look at what percentage it is of other things, those PC imports, mobile device imports, uh, software sales and so on, it's 1% or 2%. Right? Russia is not a big tech-based or consumer economy. It's basically a resource economy. Um, and, uh, and if you look at then at what we invest in, we invest in consumer staples, consumer discretionary items, so consumer items, uh, healthcare and technology. I mean, we are not going to feel much direct effect from this, which is why I came at it initially from the uh, what I think the indirect effects might be.